So um, today we are being joined by the Women African Alliance, um, who, uh, which is a network of uh, women's organizations that are resisting extractivism and extractive projects across Africa. We're going to hear how women has been thinking uh, around debt and reparations and specifically climate reparations. We're gonna hear about their campaign on reparations from uh, the African Development Bank. We're gonna hear about how they approach seeking justice for violence against, against women. We're going to hear about their approach to cost analysis and quantifying uh, injustice. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for a discussion around um, some key questions that women would like your input on. Um, so I think that's it. And I'll pass on to Trusha Reddy, who is um, the pro a programs manager at Women and lead of the Women Building Power work uh, to talk about women's work overall and their perspective on reparations. Over to you. Great, thanks so much, Sadie, and hello, everyone. Uh, lovely to have you join us today. Um, from I'm uh, coming in from Chile, Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, so very nice to see all your your faces. Um, so as Sadie was saying, um, I'm uh, at Women African Alliance, um, and we're really trying to support the building of a women's movement against what we call destructive extractivism and support women who are trying to advance development alternatives or an alternative development pathway to this extractivist model. Um, we really do look at the different frontiers of extractivism and particularly look at the costs of this extractivist model um, to women, their bodies and labor. Uh, we're also an ally, um, so we're called an alliance, we're a loose alliance in fact, but we're an ally to women who are confronting a lot of these extractive projects, which are fence line projects generally um, with, uh, for example, um, coal, oil, other dirty energy projects um, as well. Oh, it's been spotlighted. So <laughs> I look really big here. Um, <laughs> um, so um, uh, yeah, women confronting a variety of different extractivist projects. Um, like coal, oil, other dirty energy projects and related infrastructure, mining projects like minerals and metals mining, um, and even looking more recently at uh, a palm oil plantation projects. Um, we link to women in 17 countries across Africa. We are not a social movement, we but we support the building of a women's movement. And we um, rather work to try and link up popular struggles of women uh, across the continent. Um, we um, very much acknowledge that women don't necessarily on the continent identify or define themselves as feminists, but really they are um, true eco warriors, uh, many of them as peasant women farmers and fishers across the continent who are trying to defend their land, their livelihoods. Um, trying to resist these um, and resist these extractive projects and really trying to question the logic of this development model um, and trying to demand, make demands on their state um, for repair. So in terms of the reparations work, which as Sadie has indicated, um, we would is very much a work in development. Um, and which we would love to hear your thoughts on uh, inputs from your own work to help guide our work and the building of this area of work that we're developing. Um, but it's really based on this idea of the vast debt that is actually owed to Africa and, and much of the global south or the global south in general as a result of extractivism from colonial times, from neo-colonial times, by uh, colonial countries and their transnational corporations, by IFIs, as you will hear from my colleague Rain, who will speak after me, um, by private banks and so on. Um, and in terms of climate debt, of course, we acknowledge that climate debt is really about the responsibility that the global North has for causing the climate crisis and for taking up the carbon space in the atmosphere, all the while 
the, the massive impacts of the climate crisis are being faced by those in Africa and uh, particularly women and their communities um, and across the global south. Um, so we also feel like it's important to say that reparations is about an acknowledgement of the harms caused and about uh, offering up an apology as well for harms that have been caused to people and nature. And it's also fundamentally about repair um, and repair which involves some kind of payment of one kind or another that we think is important in, in, in trying to um, affect reparations. The call in terms of climate reparations, of course, um, is one of one very key element of climate justice, um, which really frames justice as a core of climate activism. And really, when we speak about reparative justice, um, we bring in wider injustices inherent to, inherent to capitalism and neocolonialism into focus. Um, it's also important to mention that we think reparations is not about, is really not about helping out those in the global south, but it's about taking responsibility fundamentally and about making amends for harms that have been done. Um, my colleague Marta will speak to the cost analysis and trying to figure out how we how we cost out the harms that have been done um, so that it goes into some kind of reparative effort. Um, and then we note as well that there are particular debts that are owed to African women for the sexual violations they have faced from the extractivist economy and for their unpaid labor that has benefited men, has may benefited the state colonizing countries. Um, and transnational corporations, for example. These are externalized costs that have never really been accounted for and do need to. So I just wanna end with maybe just talking about some of the ways that we're thinking about climate reparations specifically um, and how that might, might be affected or how the debt might be settled. Um, so the first one I would say is about the idea about taking responsibility and action. So really looking to the global north to primarily start taking action for climate, for the climate crisis. So to start mitigating uh, climate harms that, that have been done um, with the idea that the more action that is being done, the less the impacts as well that will be faced by those in Africa and the global south, uh, which is primarily important. Um, the second one is we know about providing finance. We know that from the UNFCCC with various mechanisms that have been uh, created, but also uh, seem to be debt creating, in fact, rather than um, actually trying to uh, provide finance that actually does really go towards, um, um, towards uh, um, the harms and not um, introducing new kinds of loans or other kind of debt creating mechanisms as well. Um, and it should also, in providing finance, should provide full compensation for loss and damage. Now we do have the loss and damage fund that has been created and um, that could be one of the mechanisms for um, uh, settling the climate debt, but um, we can only get that done, as I said, with, our, with providing full compensation, doing it through grants and not through loans, and so not further burdening those in the global south. We also need to have a transfer of technology. Some of these things that I've already mentioned are already um, sort of principles, uh, key principles in the UNFCCC, but they've been undermined over the last few years. And so they need to, we need to, to stand up and sort of make sure that these, these principles are sort of upheld. Um, so transpect of technology is a key one as well. Um, and that will ensure that we also don't, as we try to develop, don't end up uh, using more of the carbon space in the global south. Um, there's some campaigns like the debt for climate swaps that have been talked about as well. Um, there's been um, some arguments against using uh, against this um, because um, there's a there's an understanding that um, we should not be using uh, debt that is um, uh, the debt that has been created to go into climate uh, climate 
uh, um, action specifically, but it should be going rather to all sorts of other kinds of um, social services and so on in, in countries. But that's one of the campaigns that have been mentioned. I think there's the Leave It in the Ground initiatives as well that have come up, the Yasuni proposal being one of the key ones that has come up. Um, which really talks about um, leaving in the ground and then getting compensated by countries in the global north for being able to use leave it in the ground and then using those funds towards climate action and towards uh, the settling of climate debt. And then the last one, which is becoming more and more popular, is actually suing for harms done or climate litigation um, as a key uh, component of climate reparations. Um, and that's uh, one that we've been also exploring quite a bit um, and thinking through uh, how this can be done. Um, we know that um, we have to link it to, um, to potentially transnational corporations like fossil fuel companies who've been causing harm. Um, and uh, because they're sort of continuing to cause harm, actually uh, suing them so that we get compensation to put into um, further climate action and to solve um, to solve for, for loss or compensate for loss and damages as well. Um, so that's all I have um, to speak about for now. I have a couple of questions that I'd love to pose to everybody. But I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Rain, um, who's going to talk specifically about um, reparations from IFIs and uh, talking about the AFTB in particular. So over to her. Thank you, um, Trisha. Hi, everyone. My name is Rain Fadunubo Baimi, and I am based in uh, West Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I am coordinating our reparations campaign. Um, targeting the African Development Bank. Um, maybe uh, quickly um, give a little um, context of what the African Development Bank is. Um, the AFDB is um, part of the top five multilateral banks in the world. And that bank has been created in 1964 by the newly independent African countries uh, we wanted to take the economic um, destiny, um, the economic destiny of the continent in hand. Um, but it's very quickly um, came under the control of international institutions such as the World Bank, which adopted its architecture and governance structure. Uh, in short, um, the AFDB um, was modeled on the World Bank which as we know is capitalist and imperialist in nature. Um, the 54 African countries are the regional members of the bank. And there are also 27 non-regional members, um, including USA, Canada, China, and in terms of um, voting rights, um, power um, in Afri and between the regional members, um, Nigeria is the is, is, is a, at the top of, of, of the list. Um, the voting right power is held by the countries um, that contributes most to capital raising and more, and which means that more a country contributes and more it's, it is powerful and has influence and has great influence on the decisions in, in, in the bank. Um, the reality is that the AFTB is controlled by the non-regional members that make up the African, uh, what we call the African Development Fund, which is one of the three institutions that make up the AFTB group. And I think um, from this understanding, we understand that the, um, the, 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 the development model that the AFTB is funding on the continent is it does not and uh, does not speak to the reality of the uh, of priorities or needs of the African women and their communities, and we uh, and we and the the realities and voices from the ground show that um, the development model, as I said, uh, financed by the bank, contribute to create more poverty. Um, this more despair and destroy the nature 
causing um, exacerbating the climate crisis. And instead of the social um, economic progress that the bank is supposed to, to, to provide to, um, um, to the Africans. So through the campaign, we, we bring together um, about 10 countries and um, mostly, um, mostly uh, women impacted or living in the, um, in the area of um, project um, financed by the AFDB in, um, in West and Central Africa. And we, we want to, we want through the campaign to, to make visible the cost, the real cost of the mal development model that the bank is promoting on the continent to fulfill the neoliberal and the neo-colonial interests of the Western powers. And we, we've been um, for, we, 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 we are using, um, and we, we also want to, I think in term, um, to, to allow uh, or to, to support women um, from the ground to, to also understand the, how that development model cost on their on their body on their labor and on the natural resources that they depend to they vastly depend to live and so we um as i said um we um i think Marta will be speaking on on this uh, on the cost benefits analysis which is one of the key um tools that we use through the campaign to quantify the the lost that women are uh, women in their community are uh, are faced and to also um uh, form a it and to also um support the demands for 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 reparations um even though we notice that in some of the in most of the countries and most of the communities where um harmful projects are happening um there is um compensation mechanism that is supposed to um, give back to people um, in, enough resources to continue to sustain their life after they, after they, they lost their family land or their um, income, gener income act and generative activities. Um, the, the experience um, from the ground has, um, um, said that or showed that um, even and um, the even the the mechanism um the police the, the bank is not um it's difficult to the bank to to fulfill its responsibility in terms of um human rights um, um in terms of human rights and um, because in most of the of the cases for instance, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, women report in Cote d'Ivoire in Cameroon, women reported that um, they have lost their uh, farming land, and but as they don't have access to um, to the proper to the property title because of the patriarchal norms and tradition, and also because of the yeah because of the patriarchal norms and the tra traditional um, society they are living in. They they have not been um, they did they 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 haven't been taken into account when it comes to uh, it came to 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 to, to pay for the compensation and in uh, uh, and I this um, this is um, a double injustice for the women um, that are facing the loss of their. Uh, means of subsistence and also that can't have access to any kind of um, rep um, rep let's say compensation and so that um, with the campaign we also um, try to to strengthen women organizing and movement building um, in order to allow women to make their voice heard when it comes to speak to the injustice that they are living um, and because of the harmful um, project and the uh, development, the, the, the mal development model that has been imposed on them and to also um, demand reparations 
reparation, as Trish has said, for um um for for the cost that the um, the colonial model and the neoliberal um, uh, model are imposing on women, and which is more in, intensively um, um, feel, felt on the continent by women living on the, at the community at the community level, and I think we are um, seeking for different um, alternatives in terms of getting reparations. Um, for um, for 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 the community for the women and their communities to also by, by also exploring the litigation um, case even though we we know that the um, the financial institutions have benefit from um, um, from legal let's say legal protection that don't allow um, for some um, case um, a legal case but we we show that there is um other ways of engaging um legally or um um and the 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 bank for for his um for his action um on the at the continental level and i i hope that in the conversation that we will have um, um we can maybe and get from you some um some alternative and some idea of how to um engage and to to demand reparation for um, financial institutions and that benefit or uh, legal protection thank you thank you so much rain um next we're gonna hear uh from winnet who i believe is gonna talk about how women see justice and particularly in the context of violence against women. Uh, when it take it away. Um, thank you. So unfortunately I will not have my camera on, um, but yeah, so I, my name is Winnet and I am based in Harare, Zimbabwe, where I'm working with women and um, coordinating the uh, extractives and um, militarization and violence against women program. So I'll speak to, you know, one our, um, I think Trusha started speaking to our analysis around violence and issues around social reproduction and how women um, have and continue to actually have their labor exploited for no pay. Um, and I think the starting point for us as women is understanding that extractivism by its very nature is very violent. And women get to experience that violence in very particular ways. And um, also, um, in our analysis and experience, the police, the military, and also, you know, private companies um, normally employ violence against um, um, activists, but also just women in general um, and communities that are engaged, that, that are in... Um, communities that are in places where extractivism is taking place. So um, as women, um, we have, you know, worked to uncover uh, and document women's experiences of violence and part of our understanding of the relationship between the economy, development choices and uh, capitalism um, and how state machineries are deployed to safeguard uh, private property uh, at the interests of the elite. And one of the key things that we realized as women was we were very clear that supporting women, women work through some of the trauma is a very necessary step, uh, step in the wider agenda of making the violence that they'd experienced visible um, and enable women to claim justice on their own terms. Uh, so in this regard, um, we engaged one of our partners uh, in Zimbabwe uh, called uh, Counseling Services Unit 
and another partner in Sierra Leone called Graceland uh, to build a um, feminist collective model of trauma support um, uh, through a pilot process that involved 18 women from different extractive sites uh, who had or endured trauma at the hands of them. So the initial pilot was in Zimbabwe. Um, so they had endured trauma at the hands of the Zimbabwe military and police. Um, so the approach that we used to support the women was actually guided by uh, feminist principles. And we um, centered collective sharing, storytelling and solidarity, um, which, drop, uh, which also broke the deep isolation that women had experienced following their sexualized violations. Um, we have actually documented the trauma process uh, that we 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 used and the methodology that we used, uh, where we moved away from you know the individualized, <laughs> the individualized trauma support, uh, to a more collective um, a support process. Um, and I think based on that, one of the key things that we uh, realized was that we needed to um we needed to think about justice and the first step was the trauma support and then women and then defining what justice meant for them and it was um you know deep work of engaging with women um and, you know, going through a process from the trauma support and then women trying to define what justice means for them. And I think one of the key realizations was that justice for most women is actually not, um, you will not find it in the legalistic um, definitions of justice because uh, most of the women we're working with would talk about um, the fact that they could not get justice. Uh, so um, I think one of the key things that came out, one of the deep things that came out of our reflections with the women was, um, you know, the issues around um, thinking about um the social reproduction issues but also clearly thinking about the strategic needs of women um and because most of the women who talk about how they were raped because they had to, to lo walk long distances to get water and how they had to they were raped because they'd been moved from their you know, communities where their livelihoods were. Now, when they were now looking for places, the soldiers would then solicit sex from the women. And um, so one of the things that came out in terms of thinking about justice was not just about reparations. It was not just about, um, you know, getting uh, the perpetrators getting arrested, but it was about the inequalities, the deep inequalities that exist in society and how the women would want those to be addressed. They would want to have access to clean water. They would want to have, um, you know, their land back, their sources of livelihoods back, um, because that for them meant justice as opposed to just, uh, because they, they kept saying, even if I'm paid, one woman who went through our trauma support program um, had the children raped whilst, whilst he had gone to look for firewood. And so for her, she, she her, her issue was even if I'm paid, each time I need to leave my children, they are safe because of the way our lives. This is the reality that the women are way actually you know so part of what we're trying to do as women is to uh document the stories allow the women to define what they want and then we will work with that and i think across all the other programs in terms of the cost analysis um and you know uh, um 
other things based on the needs uh, that the women would have defined. And so maybe I'll just stop there for now. Thank you so much, Winnet. Thanks for sharing. And um, that sounds like a, a really meaningful process, if a difficult one. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing. Um, and next, we're going to hear from Marta, who is going to talk uh, about cost analysis and um, understanding how to place a, a value or number on um, harms done and the challenges with that. Uh, Marta, take it away. Um, thanks. Thanks, Avi. And hi, everyone. Um, so I've been listening very attentively to my colleagues and and then picking up the pieces that refer to 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 the piece of work that I'm busy with and that to 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 as you were saying it's to place it's it's beyond placing a value as we'll see Sadie because it's also about about making sense of the impacts and about but let me let me let me rather not get ahead of myself so. So, as you've seen from 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 Trusha and from Rain and from Winnet, uh, that the work is making visible the costs of extractivism and that's violence as well, and particularly in women and and to force the internalization of these costs back to corporations and to states, right? Because these costs are now being pushed, externalized into nature, uh, into women and and to their communities right now um and then uh, so so this this all speaks um to so there's two things about it one is that it speaks to not only attending to the costs uh, and the impacts and costs i'm not, i'm referring to intergenerational costs and we need mentioned that 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 the impact on on the children as well so so and and this the, the and how we're thinking about intergenerational costs is that often, and for instance, in one of the communities where we've piloted the uh, the cost analysis, um, the I mean, it's not ideal, but if anything, a one reparation should be land for land. And often, um, the projects don't do enough work, and um, and what's easier is to offer a lump sum of money, which looks very attractive. Um, but it runs out very quickly. And the impacts on the next generations that no longer have access to that land and what it means in terms of the, the food uh, security and sovereignty to the attachment to the land, to the history, to the values, it all has an impact. So, but again, I'm, like, I'm getting ahead of myself. So two things, cost analysis is about um, identifying quantifying whatever possible, but it is also, and importantly so, and, and if you heard Rain and you've heard Winnet and, and Trusha, uh, we try, we place always at the center of our work, women's solidarity, women's organizing and movement building. So it's the nothing about us without us. And and Winnet has, has mentioned how often a sense of um, justice comes from also um, addressing uh, deep inequalities that step through also the way that these compensation schemes are worked out without the voice, without the presence, and without the saying of women. Um, so that's 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 how we, in everything that we work, we center women, and and because very clearly, and it's we are we are supporting because as and I think Rain said, the alternatives are there. Um, and the struggles are there and they are led by women because women are the ones who are very much aware of what's at stake. What's at stake? Why? Why? Because because of the gender division of labor, no, what we've referred here as social reproduction that places women and in particular peasant women and working class women at at um responsible primary for the production, the processing of food, the preparation of food, provisioning water that we referred to now recently as well, and fuel, um, firewood, you know, to cook the water and for the care of the household members. So what happens? That that because of this, they deeply depend on natural resources and a healthy environment. Hence, when there's a catastrophic environmental fallout, the negative impacts are fall most heavily on women and increase unpaid care work amongst 
um, other impacts, right? So, so again, cost analysis is about this externalized costs that women absorb in their daily life, and that are that are and that are generally ignored. Um, um, and nor costed or compensated in the claims against corporations and states. We want to to work out, you know, what is it, and and we we want to quantify, with all the challenges um, and the, that that it presents, and there are many and manifold. Um, so so again, okay, so what's cost analysis, right? Cost analysis. Um, let, let me rather say how we went down this road. We start. And because of one of the goals is that of 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 um, forcing the internalization, no, the of costs back to corporations and and states, um, it um, it means first we we must make sense of what's been ex externalized, right? So the first concrete step is in 2019, when after a few years, a couple of years thinking about uh, coming up with an economic uh, ecofeminist impact assessment framework. We piloted in Barney in Senegal uh, with the Calcoms Women's Association, which is a it's a community that is deeply affected by coal, by a coal plant, and that's in September of 2019. And when I'm talking about the economic uh, impact assessment framework, what do I mean? It was a framework that looked into uh, differently from other assessment um, that I often used in in projects and are part of actually the the legal uh, requirements uh, uh, um, uh, were uh, was associated to four standards. One was the consent rights for affected communities and women, right? And here we we quickly found out that the communities, as as it is often the case, were not given adequate or timely information about the negative impacts or mitiga mitigation mitigation measures, and but in particular the women as well like highlighted, they had been excluded uh, from uh, key moments of project decision making, nothing that we've not seen in the society and the world we inherit, right? Um, our second standard what does on, what was on women's rights and, and an ecofeminist analysis of the project planning, the implementation and, and the monitoring, right? And what's interesting is that here data, it showed that the data in Sendu had not been collected separating women from men. Right, as a starting point of the analysis of the planning of the monitoring, there was no natural resource mapping in terms of understanding the livelihoods, you know, or the gen uh, gendered analysis of such. There was no in um, monitoring of the intersections between gender, social, economic, or environmental impacts, um, or of the impacts on health, community, culture, and the increased um, burdens of care work. What am I saying? For instance, in, the, in terms of the alteration of air quality, right? There was an increase of respiratory infections and more ill health conditions, and that because often traditionally women um, household um, in the household are in charge of uh, of the work of care, it meant that if there was an increase in the time spent in unpaid care work. Um, not only that, but also because livelihoods had been now affected and there was access, less access to, to resources, it meant also that uh, more resources had to be put in terms of transport to health facilities, visits to doctors, purchasing of medicines, and it is often the case that when uh, communities are displaced or part of the territory, uh, access to forest and to to the river and, or the water bodies are uh, as, is stopped, it also means there's no more access to traditional um, medicines that community use to 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 prevent illness or to look after their health. So this it's a compounded effect. For instance, contamination of water and soil. Um, if you don't disaggregate the data again, you won't see that uh, women, because they handle water in the production, the collection, the processing of food, in uh, in other types of care in the household, it means that they are far more exposed, right? So you're not gonna see that. In the degradation of the vegetation cover as well, right? Um, it is often the case that there's a parcel in the land that the family owns that where uh, women uh, do the vegetable garden that sources the table. Now, if this if these, um, cover is the, um, there's degradation, then there's no often either there's no 
not enough produce or if, if there's no land. I mean, in the case that they still have access to the land, right? And this also impacts that often the excess is sold in the markets, making an extra cash, an extra income. Now, this is also... Um, this also stops. The third stand that we looked into was compensation and redress. And again, here, and, and Rain mentioned it, here what happened often is because of the patriarchal norms that we inhabit, often compensation schemes and, and compensation money often, I mean, it's, it would eventually be the men that would be paid in the capacity of heads of family. Um, and that, that means that the compensation process also undermines women's rights and 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 it's particularly unjust also because of the 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 impacts the compounded impacts that it has on women's substance subsistence and livelihoods and a fourth standard that we looked into that impact um impact assessment was an ecofeminist cost benefit analysis we wanted to see whether the company uh, the project in that case in sendu the Sendu project had done any any cost benefit analysis, which we found none was taken. So, so that in 2019 left us took us somewhere, but left us hungry for more. And that what we try then is to to work with communities and with our allies in the continent to do a type of cost analysis that would um, allow us to quantify where possible. And, but not only that, to identify the costs, to make sense of them, and to build consciousness that there's other responsibles for costs that women absorb and carry, right? In the day-to-day -day life, trying to make life when the life is made very difficult. And that is how, in after some work in 22, we, we pilot an ecofeminist participatory cost analysis. We pilot one in Bombore. Uh, that's the largest gold mine, around the largest gold mine in Burkina Faso. And it was then established through financial chain mapping that there was the, the African Development Bank was part of, of the interest and of the funding of the project. So notice I said ecofeminist and I said participatory. Why ecofeminist? Because often when we hear of cost analysis, they are biased towards corporate and political interest. So in our view, a just cost analysis would center um, core issues such as ecofeminism and the cross-generational equity that I referred to earlier in talking in, of intergenerational uh, costs and, and, and also show commitment to addressing the ecological and climate crisis. Um, so that means that we are looking into costs for the planet and for human life now and for future generations, right? And, and of course, the data must always be disaggregated by gender, by age, class and location. So we, we wanted to look into, uh, so that that was the per first approach to a cost analysis. And the second was participatory and why. And this refers back to what I, what I said earlier that our work centers women's organizing, women's solidarity, women power and movement, organ and movement building, right? So whatever research cost analysis tool had to be participatory, we cannot be extractivist, right? Um, claims for reparations must, be part and must be owned by the communities, and it, might, it must they must end in communities which were the brand, right? So, so and our work, as we see it, is is to help build such organizing, especially in the case of corporations that their first and foremost rule in the book is trying to divide communities, and and just very quickly in Bombore, um, we. Mm, in Mombore, like we did the, the field research and then we learned a lot. Um, impacts and the shortcomings and the challenges. Um, and that we can leave it later for the q and if you want, because I don't want to take more much time. But what our idea was that, for instance, that the findings could be used by the women, no, and the wider community or the idea overall. In, in the struggles for concrete justice, no? targeting the corporation. When the corporation comes and says, this is the compensation we give, and they can say, well, actually not. This, this is all that you're impacting. By Orcade, by our, our partner um, in, in uh, Burkina Faso, who's been accompanying and fighting and supporting uh, along with the women, right, for, in this struggle. Um, they, 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 the idea was to advocate for reforms about the comp compensation law and policy. And, yet, and here's the thing, like they want, the thing is that the national government 
uh, their compensation policy provides no compensation for the loss of income of artisanal mining, uh, an endeavor that many women and rural um, peasant women are also engaged with and by which they supplement uh, the family income to pay for school fees, for uh, for um, for health from the clinic, for pay for medicines and whatever needs to be repaired in the house, right? Um, or, or the no framework for compensation is related to women now working extra six hours a day to get fire, food and water. And not, not even to say what uh, Winnet was, was referring to about the levels of violence that uh, women are exposed to because of, of this extra um, walking and, and other circumstances that, that, that such uh, projects put them into. Um, and, and at the same time, and this, that's the second, and I'm referring to the second pilot cost analysis we've tested, um, we were also intensifying the work addressing climate crisis. And that was after cyclones that impacted Madagascar and other parts of Southern Africa, also around 2018, 2019. So then we, we worked with um, another partner with CRAT in Madagascar uh, to implement a second cost analysis. Um, and here the idea CRAT uh, also as one of the, the many uh, goals of, of this, uh, this exercise was for them, for instance, to, to use in their advocacy work nationally um, for the rural for rural women to get more more of the adaptation funds you know, that, that the government itself sets to to disburse. And also they support the delegation of Madagascar at the at the at the at COP, no? So that and 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 so that was the cost analysis were also inform or strengthen the position that the 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 financial commitment it's not enough to meet the needs of climate adaptation and mitigation. Also that such fund needs to meet the needs of farmers, of rural women, no, and communities, which are the frontline uh, victims of of climate change. And also to demand that uh, the cancellation of the debt, you know, as as to to free resources to in countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. Methodological, just and finally, <laughs> methodological tools that we are piloting and we've used, and it's 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 work that it's in in revision and we are constantly thinking of. Um, uh, one is, for instance, um, building together a resource map for that was in 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 Toliara, no, in Madagascar, for um, for for all the participants and for everyone in the the women in the community to. In, through group discussions to analyze the climate uh, change uh, changes no? that in access to natural resources and in the relationship with the natural environment. We also use a, uh, the food basket to examine food consumption at household level and the impact of the climate crisis because there were cyclones and there was also a drought. There's a drought. Um, a questionnaire um, and on the impacts of climate change, on the access to land, to water, to energy, the health, uh, women's productive and reproductive, produ reproductive workload, and the 24-hour clock that analyzes that, no, that women's time use and how now it's increased in terms of sourcing water and sourcing uh, the needs of the household. And also a scale that tried to assess the perception of stress and well-being. So that is, um, we are busy now with uh, with uh, the field research notes. It's a lengthy process and it involves uh, a lot of documentation in indigenous languages that needs to be translated to be systematized with, um, um, with uh, experts we are working with in terms of how to best quantify and how to make sense of, you know, of the different costs. Um, um, I think I'm not going to share what's Bombore. And, and just to say that, as, that, as I was saying, I was saying one, one of the things that's been important for us in these two pilot cases is to, to, to see, to learn what, what can be done better. No? As, as, and, and, and we're now looking into to the impacts of the Nachtigal hydroelectric dam. Um, that is being built was in, in, in Cameroon and how it has impacted the communities in Bachenga and especially the women. So we are now busy planning with our, our partners and with the community and the women leaders uh, cost analysis there. And, and also there's plans uh, for, for another 
uh, cost analysis in in um, projects related. I mean, funded by the AFVB in um, in Cote d'Ivoire. And I think I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it here for now, Sadi. Great, thank you, um, Marta. That's really um, fascinating work and and very detailed and specific work about like what are the the details that you need to work out in order to secure reparations um, for the communities that are affected by extractivism. Um, we're going to move on to some Q&A and normally, um, normally I would uh, uh, open the floor up to you, um, but actually um, the uh, speakers today have come with a number of questions uh, for you, uh, the attendees, because they're interested in understanding, um, working through some of the thorny questions and challenges that they have with their work. Um, so yeah, if you um, have any thoughts, um, particularly any experiences that relate to these questions, um, we would really welcome your inputs. Um, so there's a there's a list of questions here, and I'll put them in the chat. Um, but maybe what we can do is start um, with the first question, and uh, and then walk through them, and like maybe we can start with a bit of context from our speakers before we walk through the questions. So the first question is, is about how to quantify or at least make visible mental health impacts. And I assume you're referring to the impacts of um, these extractive projects, um, but also we could talk about climate change um, in that context as well. Um, and also intergenerational impacts. So the impacts of climate, uh, but also of extractive projects on future generations. Um, I think this is your question, Marta. Did you um, did you have anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Eddie. Um, and and he has to say that more than questions placed shame to <laughs> to to our uh, colleagues and and friends uh, here online is is um, is really like to tease, you know, and show what where we are at, you know. I mean. And I mean, of course, if you have any any experience, any or any any lead, no, it, it will be helpful. Um, and yeah, so this is a, one of the things, no, that um, um, I mean, it's it is it um it any of us when our livelihoods are affected, um, our, our health and uh, psychosomatic, physical health, and also mental health is is deeply. Um, affected, and here the issue is about how how to make how to make that visible and how how to to add it to to the to the the scale of trauma and the 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 need for this being part of reparations that we have. No, and um, I think Trisha was referring to reparations as you know that it entails many things, and I want to add one more in Bombore when we did the the pilot and i think it's actually in the un declaration and the, there's a there's a definition of reparations and and one of them is that the certainty that it won't be, there will be no repetition you know and what often what happens here and and uh, when the field research was done in bombori by our allies our field researcher was supposed to join couldn't because of rebel activity in the area so what i'm saying is that often what we find is that these are uh Communities, communities that because of colonialism, neoliberal, this is not the first tra trauma that comes across, you know. And so there's there's a, there's intergenerational trauma as well, as well as 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 a, a, a combining of mental health. So so yeah. So so this is, here is where we struggle. How do we how do we make it? This, how do we we make it part of the cost analysis in a way that not necessarily quantify, but we can. 
we can show in numbers. And I've spoken to colleagues in New Zealand who've done work around uh, the indigenous communities there. But then, of course, part of the access to data in terms of local clinics, and that is, is far more um, systematized and accessible than, than, than what, would, what we would have here. Um, or in some of the communities we, we, we are supporting and working with. Um, and the same goes with the intergenerational cause there's a there's a two, one minute lovely story from and it's a thing that happened from one of the our colleagues we've worked with um, um, Ernie who who was part of the people of the called uh, of the witnesses who test, uh, testified in court against the Lamu project in Kenya that was having going to have a huge impact on on the on the on the community on the communities now um ernie knew that the judges were all grandparents so one of the things that he 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 told he's told us that he raised in court was that if your grandson uh your granddaughter because of the pollution is now develops asthma the compensation can pay maybe for the you know they can tell you well don't worry the compensation will pay for the for the for the medicine he says, but but who how how does one repair? How does one cost and and compensate the worry, no? The 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 stress that it puts on on you. So 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 it's about that. It's about we struggle with how how do we go about it. That's that's one question that we are pondering. Not that we expect answers. <laughs> we well, welcome though. Thanks, Marta. Um, does anyone want to be brave and and uh, offer a first? Uh, Opinion, any thoughts or ideas around this question of measuring impacts surrounding well-being, mental health, um, or intergenerational impacts of projects? You want to come in? I have one, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but I was thinking about um, this concept of uh, quality adjusted life years. Um, I don't know if that's something you've looked at in your uh, analysis already, but I guess it's the idea that, um, well, I mean, you could you can look at like, the amount of um well for, like does this have an impact um both on how long a person lives but also the quality of the years they live based on measuring sickness and also ill mental health and um i think there's i i'm not very informed about this but i um i would imagine that there are in, indices that can measure um, changes in in length of life and quality of life. I think maybe the challenge is attributing that specifically to the project, but um, and and also finding the data, um, especially in in a situation where maybe yeah your local clinics or like it's hard to collect the baseline survey data that you would need um, in order to be able to compare it to the analysis. Uh, but yeah, that, that was just kind of what came to mind um, with regard to that. Anyone else want to come in on this question? My, sorry, I can't have my um, video on, but um, my mic is working, so it's good. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who spoke for sharing so much of like your experiences and research with us. It was really valuable to hear about. Um, in terms of like measuring and quantifying um, like what you talked about, the like mental health effects that are often, um, you know, invisible to us and they're not quantified or tracked very well. I think one approach that came to mind was um, the capability approach by Martin Nussbaum and Amartya Sen, um, which I think is really like relevant to what we're seeing in the climate crisis and how the burdens are really unfairly distributed. Um, but I, I can send a link to it, but essentially it's an approach, um, I think it remains quite an academic one, but it's very popular and it's really like highly talked about. 
Um, but it's looking at not just measuring, you know, premature death, life expectancy, but going beyond that to look at, you know, the quality of life. Um, you know, so instead of just applying um, like a baseline measurement, it's looking at so much more about whether people are actually able to fulfill their full cap capabilities, their full potentials as human beings. Um, and I think potentially like drawing on this approach is a good way to look at how I think so often when we're in the global north we apply like a, this much higher standard of humanity that for some reason we don't seem to apply in the global south when we talk about um, the violence the trauma that women in particular face um, so that was just sort of my like thoughts on that I don't really know if that's really useful um, but one more thing that I did want to say is that I work for a charity called Voice of Change England. And I think a lot of what you said really resonates to, um, for instance, like the housing crisis that we're seeing in the UK itself. Um, so when we we have a huge issue of like mold and damp. And again, um, it's looking at a lot of research now is looking at how mold is political. And it's very symbolic of this broader neglect that a lot of um, you know minority ethnic racialized communities face, and so that same disparity exists in the UK as well. Um, so I, I just thought I'd share that, and then possibly put it in the link as well, because there's some really useful research around that that I think could be really useful to, um, you know, like you said, build solidarity. But yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, yeah, both of those points are really really interesting. Any other thoughts on this question of mental health impacts or also of intergenerational impacts? So as I saw a question in the chat from earlier, um, I think it was Mira. Um, saying, are there any documents evidencing the cost of analysis and reparation? Um, do you, are, are you referring to like uh, the cost of, like, like are, the, are there examples of um, projects or instances where they have made a full, a full cost analysis and like made that specific number amount? Um, for reparations, is that is that your question, Mira? Uh, not hearing anything from Mira. Maybe um, is do one of you um want to maybe Marta um answer whether there's some examples of like fully costed demands for reparations. So what we, yeah, well, I read the question and I wasn't sure. I mean, what, what, um, like in the case of of Bombore, um, and uh, or on the 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 gold mine, or in the case of of the hydroelectric dam in 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 uh, Cameroon that we are looking into. There's, there's, of course. I mean, the 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 projects themselves, they they do a rapid calculation of of what they consider, no, are are the 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 costs and 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 compensation amounts are set and schemes and distributed and and here the process is flawed from the beginning to end, no, um, to start with who who they sense, you know, when they conduct the census, no one is informed. We recently were in Cameroon, and and with all, you know, it also fits, um. Um, it feeds also uh, distrust in the community. You know, why was my name not included, but I saw yours. When often it's 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 some sort of magic that that the that the community and then or that that the the projects uh, arrive to uh, or the how they calculate um, the the trees that are because often like in Nachtigal, there's access to to orchards and the common orchards, you know, to which people supply, um, and it's not land that it's owned, but it's common land. I mean, not owned by a private title deed. 
and how they they count the trees and how they compensate and um, women were telling us they were asked to to sign documents that they did not understood and and rushed you know and then they find out that later so so this this cost analysis are done but it's highly disputed now as if you're asking about cost analysis done by 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 communities there are several there are different um there's uh, there's more a lot more work done in terms of of ecological and climate assessment and and because also it also serves a basis a basis for litigations in the states and others when it comes to an uh, incorporating a lot more the uh, a feminist perspective that takes into account uh, social reproduction labor and that I've not come across um, any cases and and what we've done we are yet to produce the a document that will share it's in production so so i'll we'll share with with Sadi and but is that's what i'm okay that's what you meant okay so i think i've answered so we not yet but it's true that for instance in composition with our partners in Mombore, um the already the 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 conduction and the the research that was done on ground it led to for instance in 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 more well, to, 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 so for once, um, Odette was telling us, no, um, that the women felt a lot more, uh, there was a lot more strength and convincement from what they were demanding as right, right? So, so there's a, there's a point in also strengthening that, that organizing that I said before. And then there's a part also that it meant, uh, that they could de make other demands. Um, as as the mine, like in the case of Nachtigal, they've tried. They, I think that the compensation scheme that has been rushed is, has has been re reopened three times because communities struggle. The moment that they see the the losses, um, um, and and even before, you know, they 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 don't conform. So what we what we're providing with this is yet another a tool as well, no, to 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 look into other things that often it's invisible, not to the eye because women know. Uh, but to 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 the way the way the the, the world functions. Thank you, Marta. Um, Buka Coffee wrote something in the chat. Did you want to um, did you want to share your perspective? Yes, uh, I'm more than happy to elaborate on what I try to put uh, in there, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, um, it's about reparation, really, um, because uh, um, I clearly understand, you know, I mean, different perspectives, you know, I mean, which you, you know, I mean, we all want to address. The, the the issue but there is something which is pretty much obvious is the fact that uh, these are common issues uh in terms of the context of of africa for for instance um in ivory coast they share pretty much the same issues which is you know, I mean, which are in uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, in in Gabon, in uh, Sierra Leone, in uh, Cameroon, and and stuff. So, for me, uh, in addressing the issue, we need to to actually go back to why we find ourselves in this uh, position. And uh, somebody mentioned uh, the. The, the African Development Bank, for instance, those are not institutions, you know, I mean, created, you know, I mean, to help Africans. It's not because uh, it has the tag development, you know, I mean, that means that uh, they are created to, to help Africa develop. And there is also the issue of um, the fact that the, here is an institution which is called uh, an African Development Bank. When the truth is, there is no such thing 
as Africa as an entity. Because for Africa to, 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 to be recognized as an entity, there needs to be some kind of interaction between uh, the different pieces of, 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 that, of the puzzle called Africa. But there is none because of the fact that we need to refer to, 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 to the colonial masters, you know what I mean, to even interact between us. And that is for me one of the, the most important uh, uh, things we need to address be before talking about, um, you know what I mean, development and, and stuff. Otherwise, uh, uh, what is happening on the ground is basically uh, we are only reacting to even uh, uh, to, to the narrative which is already been set by uh, colonialism. So we need to free ourselves from, 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 from the colonial mindsets which created the, those micro entities we believe are fake. They are not, they were never created uh, 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 to be viable entities as states. They were created primarily because of the fact that uh, 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 Western imperialism, uh, okay, the, the basic example, the, there is a country called Ivory Coast, but because of the fact that the colonial mindset uh, 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 believe that that piece of land was all about ivory, not the people. So basically that's a bit uh, what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we have another question here in the chat from Annie, which is, isn't like, isn't this an issue for the IMF uh, to be providing reparations? Um, is there anyone from w women who wants to try and um, answer this question? Have you interacted at all with like demands um, for the IMF or these other more international uh, multilateral institutions and IFIs? I, uh, I, I was gonna, you. sorry, I was asking whether the speakers wanted to come in, yeah. maybe. Um, Trusha or Winnet or Rain? Um, Sadiq, um, can you please um, come back on the question? I didn't get you, sorry. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, so I guess the question is that whether, is whether um, the IMF, uh, like the International Monetary Fund or other um, more international organizations should also provide reparations um, and whether whether um, that's something that you have interacted with in your work before making demands to those more global um, multilateral institutions. Uh, okay, maybe I will try and, and respond to this. Um, I think, yes, you know, in most of the um, projects of the development project that are implemented on the continent, there is a co, um, is in, they are mostly co-funded projects with the World Bank, the FMO and, and the African Development Bank. But we, um, the, and there is uh, many um, groups on the continent that are addressing um, the, the, I, the, the, the World Bank or the IMF um, accountability um, to Africans. But for women, we uh, are focusing more on the African Development Bank because um, that bank is um, supposed to be um, an African bank and is supposed to, um, yeah, to finance a development model that speaks and responds to the African needs and and priorities, and um, and yeah, we we just decided to focus on the African Development Bank and maybe just a comment on what um Kofi um said that just to to say that I totally um agree with his analysis and we and and I think one of the um. Um, uh, one of the of the purpose of the campaign also is to make visible the neoliberalism and the neocolonialism that is um, that is hide 
behind the so-called development model. Um, and I think that we are challenging um, the Western imperialism through um, um, community organizing to say no and to say enough to in, is enough is enough to the to a development model that is not speaking to our needs and and priority and that um, um, yeah um, amplify um, social injustice and and poverty poverty on the continent yeah thank you thanks so much Ren. Um, there's another question here, which I thought maybe would be interesting to hear from uh, the audience again, which is where what other examples of, of feminist perspectives have been used to looking at the impacts and losses of both of uh, from extractivist projects and um, from uh, from climate change. I wonder if anyone else um, wants to come in on on examples that would be interesting potentially for women to look at um, when they're looking at feminist perspectives of resisting extractivism. Is there anyone who wants to come in on this? Catherine? Yes, maybe I can I can try something. Uh, first, I want to thank you everyone like for all your, your comment and sharing. It was really, really interesting. Um, I, maybe um, I, I used to work a lot in India. Uh, so with communities uh, and women communities also fighting against mining. Um, and maybe like my answer will also um, bring back, you know, the first question about how we can uh, map mental health issue and like impact and losses. Um, what I've been working on uh, with the, the NGO uh, where I work and also as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, it's um, how to map uh, emotions <laughs> um, and also like uh, like emotional geographies, which is really, um, yes, it's a, an important concept in eco-feminist, but also feminist political ecology. Uh, frameworks where the idea is to really like start by um, listening to um, uh, feeling uh, affect emotion from women and also like other members of communities uh, you know during um, in the same family so and in the same generation so to see how uh, we can take all these uh, emotion um, from local local places and how toward a uh, translocal solidarity uh, has woman I think is a really amazing example of a translocal uh, solidarity um, uh, which we can see also in India but more like in uh, um, in the country in itself and not on the sub uh, the, 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 the subcontinent but um yeah, so how we can start from these sharing of experience and emotion about uh, how they feel when like about losses and everything and how when we can we bring all of this together, we can quantify, you know, these like an emotion because we this and this can be used uh, in court, for example, like, you, you know, when you go in court and you want to say no for project. So um, maybe like it's a it's a thing I can bring here. Um, about that and also um, we, we talk a lot about solidarity but I think one of other basis of um, feminist perspective is also friendship you know um, with the, the foundation Louvo which uh, we are based in Colombia and Brazil and we work also with women affected by mining but also other kind of violence and we're trying you know to to build friendships <laughs> to bring friendship between women so because friendships is also um a way to share yeah to share experiences but also love and like to care um so yeah i think like to maybe develop how we can bring community like in a friendship solidarity so it's a uh, yeah so it's another <laughs> i i don't know if it's uh, answering the question but i think it can uh, and I, I really like what women is doing. It's amazing. When I found the work of women, I was like, wow, okay, this is really huge and uh, powerful. So yeah, that's it. I can end it here. Thanks so much, Catherine. I love, 
I love the idea of building friendship as resistance and solidarity. Uh, Elaine. Yeah, forgive me for rolling out of bed at 7 a.m. without brushing my hair or getting dressed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say that on the IMF question about reparations, that I've never heard of that being done. <laughs> and, you know, the IMF's role, if anybody doesn't know, you know, is multiple, but key things that come to mind is, first of all, it's the gatekeeper for all um, other lenders, all the IF multilateral development banks, including the African Development Bank, um, even bilateral um, so-called aid agencies. They cannot even give a penny, lend, lend a penny to any country without the IMF stamp of approval. So the IMF's the gatekeeper that says that a country's balance of payments are okay, are in good enough shape for all the others. Um, so it's very fundamental. Um, and then since it focused, secondly, it focuses on balance of payments, on ensuring that countries' revenues exceed their debts in plain language, um, it keeps making loans to countries to um, get them out of current debt, which deepens their debt in this vicious cycle, as you know. So what it doesn't do is critical in answering the question about reparations in the IMF, and that is it doesn't lend money like the MDBs do for projects, for projects that forcibly dislocate women and other people, you know, for any projects whatsoever. It lends money to ministries of finance to so-called, they pretend, reduce debt while well, they actually increase debt in this vicious cycle. So I don't know of anybody ever taking um, the IMF to task for reparations or to court um, in any, any such kind of process. But I love the idea of it. Now on climate change in the last five years or so, Thanks to a lot of civil society pressure, the IMF finally has been saying that climate change is macro critical. And also, you may know, they just approved a year and a half or two years ago their first gender strategy, which is just awful. The gender strategy is completely neoliberal and neocolonial. It's, it just takes the entire IMF framework, as do all the MDBs, their entire neocolonial framework, and dump gender into it. And so I don't think it ever once mentions rights, human rights, women's rights. Um, so there's so many good reasons. I mean, there's every reason under the sun to call for reparations from the IMF. How to do it, I haven't a clue, um, but I thought I'd share this background information, which you may know already, but in case anybody doesn't, um, that, you know, the IMF is, not an easy organization, institution, you know, set up by the World War II winners who still rule it um, to challenge. It's not easy to challenge because its mode of operation, what it does also are so far away, they claim, from the projects on the ground where you're working. So I just thought I'd share that um, and would welcome any responses to these ideas that show how challenging it is to um, seek anything from the IMF. Thanks so, so much, Elaine. Um, yeah, fascinating discussion. I'm sure there are some uh, critical um, economists who uh, might have more thoughts on how to do this, but love the idea. Um, there's a comment from Mary that there's a documentary, The Ants and the, and the Grasshopper, focused on a female farmer in Malawi. Could be interesting to check out. Um, just noting that we've come to time, I wanted to thank everyone for joining today. It was a really interesting discussion and so great to hear about the amazing work that women is doing um, across Africa. I just wanted to do a little shout out if you haven't already. Um, we have a newsletter for the Climate Reparations Network uh, that you can join. We send out uh, other events like this. I'm sure some of you are already part of it. We're hosting more of these sessions over the coming months. We've got one for the 27th of June 
which is uh, we're going to hear um, from a member of the Yupka indigenous community that are resisting Glencore's mines in Colombia. And on the 10th of July, we'll hear about the global, uh, global South debt crisis, uh, very relevant also to this discussion and what that means for climate reparations. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, please keep an eye out for those sessions and, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.